breaking news this Thursday night, a major break in a decades-old cold case. The man who murdered a Toronto girl in 1984. I'm here because of the diligent work of Toronto police investigators. The new technology that identified the killer and why he won't be brought to justice. Pushing for peace. If we don't get this right, is that people will die. Mounting pressure to resolve Nova Scotia's lobster fishing feud. The RCMP, they're useless. Alarming new increases in COVID-19 cases where infections were once low. The mission to control the spread. Campaigning in the time of COVID, our Jackson Prosco is in North Carolina tonight. And when your vacation plans go south. COVID came, which changed our plans completely. This year's holiday haven for snowbirds. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with the murder of a little girl that has gone unsolved for 36 years. Today, Toronto police say they have finally cracked the case of Christine Jessup, who was killed in 1984. She was nine years old when she went missing in Queensville, Ontario, a small town north of Toronto. Police say she had plans to meet a friend at a nearby park after school that day, but never showed up. She took the school bus home, dropped off her bag, and vanished. The case haunted her family and the community. A neighbor was wrongly convicted, exonerated by DNA testing. Today, this man was named as Jessup's killer, Calvin Hoover, who was 28 at the time and known to the family. Police say new DNA technology linked him to the case. It's genetic genealogy that we have actually used. Genetic genealogy is a very useful tool in murder investigations such as this one. It is not a DNA match. What it is, is uh, it provides a potential, and I must stress a potential, uh, family uh, lineage from a DNA sample. In our top story tonight, Eric Sorensen explains how the cold case was cracked, what it means for the Jessup family, and why the killer will never be charged. It's an announcement few thought they would ever hear. Calvin Hoover of Toronto, Ontario, was 28 years old in 1984. A name, finally, for the killer of nine-year-old Christine Jessup, who disappeared this month 36 years ago. The man identified, Calvin Hoover, was an acquaintance of Christine's parents. This is not a reason to celebrate. It does, however, allow us to take a major step forward in our efforts to bring justice to Christine's family. Hoover died by suicide five years ago. Police say they tracked him down with DNA using a police-only data bank in the United States that identified two family trees. The name Calvin Hoover is one of the names that came up in two specific families that we saw built out. The name Calvin Hoover, uh, upon um, review of the investigative file, is a name that uh, we know had a uh, connection to the Jessup family. There was no trace of Christine when she disappeared. Her body found weeks later, 50 kilometers from her home in Queensville, north of Toronto. She'd been raped and stabbed multiple times. Months later, police charged Jessup's next door neighbor, 24-year-old Guy Paul Morin, with murder, setting off legal battles that would last a decade. Morin was first acquitted of the crime, but in a second trial in 1992 was found guilty and went to prison. Then DNA technology, still in its infancy, cleared him. And finally, as I said, DNA has exonerated me 100%. The case roiled the Ontario justice system and left the Jessup family lost. The trail of the killer had long since gone cold. Her brother, Ken Jessup. You know, Christine is still dead and there is still no person no longer accused. Now, a quarter century later, Ken Jessup spoke with Global News now that Calvin Hoover has been identified. Disbelief. I was stunned. It's a wonderful day for justice. And at least uh, he saved us the uh, hardship of going through another trial. This from Guy Paul Morin, who was wrongfully convicted. Christine's murder was a terrible and tragic event. When DNA exonerated me in 1995, I was sure one day DNA would reveal the real killer, and now it has. This is one of those cases where science has won out over the justice system. More than 30 years after her daughter died, Janet Jessup told Global News what she'd wanted most. Where's he? That's the question I have. I want to find him, him, her, it, whomever. And that's my goal. Finally, it seems that goal has been reached. 
Eric Eufers covered Christine Jessup's case when she disappeared more than 30 years ago. Now police have identified her killer, but he's dead. So it's an ending, but is it justice? Well, it's justice a long time in coming, but it is still justice to finally solve a crime. I mean, that is the ultimate goal whenever there's a tragedy like this. I think there's huge relief for the police because they went down the wrong path after the wrong person at the time. There's relief for the justice system because of the wrongful conviction. And I think for the family, there has to be a sense of closure now because really, the Jessops, year after year, were just wanting answers and they couldn't get the right answer. And looks like now they finally do have an answer as tragic as, uh, as it ultimately is. And so, Eric, is the case now closed? No, it's not closed. I mean, Calvin Hoover uh, was known to police because he was part of a wide investigation at the time. He was a, a friend or at least an acquaintance of the family, so they knew of him, but he was not a suspect at the time. Now they're looking for the public's help in filling in the holes between 1984, when uh, Christine disappeared and died, and 2015, when Hoover uh, died. And so they've got a lot of years to fill in the pieces to try and figure out what he did during all that time. All right, Eric Sorensen in Toronto, thanks. Now to Nova Scotia and the violence over the lobster catch. Indigenous fishers are pushing ahead with their self-regulated lobster fishery and threaten legal action against those who stand in the way. At the heart of the issue are the rights of Indigenous lobster harvesters to fish outside the commercial season, rights protected by the Marshall decision, a Supreme Court of Canada ruling. Indigenous leaders are demanding the federal government enforce the law. Here's what the Indigenous Services Minister said today. These unacceptable acts of violence, including the assault of Chief Sack, threats and intimidation, some racist in nature, cannot and will not fetter the right of the Mi'kmaq people to pursue a moderate livelihood as affirmed close to 25 years ago in the Marshall decision. But talk is not leading to any resolution on the docks in Nova Scotia, as Ross Lord reports. Indigenous fishers guard a driveway to a lobster holding pound as police screen nearby traffic to rule out potential troublemakers. Bitterness simmers from Tuesday night when an angry group of commercial fishers threatened an indigenous harvester attacking property and removing his lobsters in full view of the RCMP. Look at them. I know. What do you mean you know? The chief of the Sabaganagati First Nation suggests his members are going alone. Very concerned for all of our people. You know, the safety, and uh, it's come to the point where it's a matter of, do our lives matter? Chief Sack himself had a physical altercation with another man. Sack says he'll pursue assault charges and possibly legal action against organizations assigned to protect his people from what he calls racist violence. The RCMP, they're useless. He sent a letter to the Prime Minister urging him to ensure the safety of Indigenous fishers. The RCMP defends its handling of the violent protests. Our goal is, is for everyone to go home uh, that, that night. And uh, in this case, uh, we, we feel we were fortunate in the case that everybody did, that there was no injuries uh, involved in either of these here incidents. Nova Scotia Premier Stephen McNeil says he's disappointed the federal government has failed to defuse tensions. The government has held a series of meetings, some with First Nations leaders, others with commercial harvesters, even though the fisheries minister has kept a low profile. Yesterday's actions, unfortunately, they were they're, they're uncalled for uh, and e extremely disappointing and uh, disgusting, for, for lack of a better word. And unfortunately, those, those actions could be stalling the, the negotiations that we were making very good progress on. The Indigenous Services Minister, while acknowledging systemic racism in policing, is clear about what's at stake. Uh, the risk, if we don't get this right, is that people will die. And I think everyone should be clear about what that means, um, because violence begets violence. Untangling tensions has been just as confounding as it was when the Supreme Court upheld Indigenous fishing rights more than 20 years ago. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. Now to another crisis beginning to spread through Indigenous communities across Canada. They were largely shielded from COVID-19 in the spring, but reserves are now reporting the highest number of active cases since the start of the pandemic. Mike LeCouture reports on what's driving the spread and what's being done to try to contain it. From the outside, it's a nondescript building in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. But a service inside the Full Gospel Outreach Centre is being linked to at least 25 cases of COVID-19. 
Many in attendance were from surrounding First Nations communities, and it's helped to push the total case count in Indigenous communities to 209. I think the highest that we've seen it to date, at any, at any date. Uh, and so it's very alarming. Especially because of how well Indigenous communities fared during the first wave. But now the curve is bending up. The biggest concern is how the virus can spread quickly in multi-generational homes and the fragility of the health care system in the north. You know, if Montreal can get overwhelmed, um, the health care system in Montreal can get overwhelmed. Certainly a small remote community fly in access um, can easily get overwhelmed as well. It's why a chief of a First Nation in northern Saskatchewan ordered a lockdown of her community after a spike in COVID-19 cases. We have a high population of elders in our communities, uh, those with compromised immune systems. Um, so we're, we're really concerned because it's a serious health threat. An even bigger threat, according to Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller, is the lack of trust Indigenous communities have in the health care system, especially after the world saw what happened to Joyce Echequan in a Quebec hospital. It's why he's convening a meeting on Friday with the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations and First Nations leaders to start the process of eliminating systemic racism in Canada's health system. Donna. All right, Mike LeCouture, thank you. In Manitoba, the spread of COVID-19 is becoming alarming. 173 new cases were reported today. That's a record number in Manitoba. The province's top doctor says widespread restrictions on gathering and other tough rules could be imposed in Winnipeg as early as tomorrow. Dr. Brent Rusin says people have been asked to reduce their contacts and stay home if they're sick, but it's clear some people are not listening. Well, we can see we've lost um We've lost our way with the fundamentals at this point, so uh, we're going to need to act uh, to be able to bring down these numbers. Today's case count in Manitoba is the third day of record high numbers there. In Saskatchewan, there are 33 new cases today. Further west, Alberta has 244. B.C., more than 140. And big numbers again today in Quebec. 969 new cases there, and in Ontario, 783. There's an update tonight on the outbreak at Spinco Fitness Studio in Hamilton, Ontario. At least 72 cases are now linked to the cycling studio after three more people tested positive. Public health officials have said they are reviewing rules for fitness studios. The coronavirus and vying for votes coming up. We're in North Carolina where the pandemic has become an election flashpoint. To the American presidential campaign now, Joe Biden's running mate Kamala Harris has suspended her campaign events and travel until Monday because her communications director and a flight crew member have tested positive for COVID-19. Harris was on a flight with both those people the day after the vice presidential debate with Mike Pence, though the campaign says she was not in close contact with them. And if lineups for early voting are any indication, thousands of Americans seem highly motivated to cast their ballot. In North Carolina, where early voting started today, people waited for hours in long lines. And as they wait, COVID case numbers keep rising. In North Carolina, more than 2,500 new cases were reported just today. And yet President Trump keeps telling people not to worry. Jackson Prosco reports. Another day, another tightly packed Trump rally in another state where COVID-19 cases are surging. Tell your governor, open up your state, open up your schools. Despite the rise in cases here and across the country, the president told the crowd of mostly maskless supporters that the pandemic would soon be over. My plan is already crushing the virus. Trump! Many Trump voters were already convinced that the virus is no big deal. Are you worried at all about your safety being here today, packed no. together in a crowd? No. Not at all? Not at all. Will you wear a mask? No. I think that there's a lot of other more pressing issues than the pandemic. Hey, Trump! Some have embraced Trump's falsehoods and the grim U.S. death toll and claim it's a tale of success. We are uh, behind him 100%. The U.S. is doing more than your, gov your Canadian gov you know, uh, population, uh, the European population. The U.S. Is, is doing better than anyone around the world right now. North Carolina, population 10 million, has recorded more cases than all of Canada. Today, the unemployment rate sits at 8.5 percent. This has been uh, beyond embarrassing to friends uh, around the world and even around the country um, to see the, the lack of leadership. 
To Joe Biden supporters, Trump's record is one of historic failure. Brewery owner Celeste Beatty has seen business drop off by 70 percent. She was hoping for another government relief package until Trump called off the talks. And to have, you know, the president saying, well, we're just going to hold back until after the election. That was very insulting and just so inhumane to have him play around with people's lives like that when there's such a great need. Four years ago, Trump easily won North Carolina. Today, polls suggest this critical swing state could go either way. The pandemic threatens Donald Trump's chances at a second term, but hasn't cost him the support of his ever loyal base. Work He's hard. the only true one that is telling the truth. Yes. And is going to save us all. If undecided voters were hoping for any sort of clarity in these final days of the campaign, they likely won't be getting it tonight. What was supposed to have been a presidential debate has been replaced with two separate and simultaneous town halls featuring Trump and Joe Biden, different channels at the same time. That means that partisan supporters are likely to bubble themselves with the candidate of their choice and not see the opposing candidate's views expressed in any way if they don't want to hear them. Donna? Jackson Prosco in North Carolina, thanks. Strict new restrictions in England. Still ahead, why not everyone is on board. Queen Elizabeth is back in action. This was her first official engagement in seven months. She went to Portadown Military Research Facility with her grandson, Prince William. All of them kept far apart, though none wore masks. Since March, the 94-year-old has been meeting people virtually from Windsor Castle. She was with a small team of dedicated staff today, known as HMS Bubble, who have been isolating with her at the palace. COVID-19 cases across Europe are surging at an alarming rate. And today, the World Health Organization's director for Europe said the region is seeing a significant rise in hospital admissions and deaths and an exponential increase in daily cases. The region has registered the highest weekly incidence of COVID-19 cases since the beginning of the pandemic, with almost 700,000 cases reported. Confirmed cases have now surpassed 7 million, moving from 6 to 7 million cases in just 10 days. Several countries, including the UK, are reimposing limits on gatherings they hope will stop the spread of the virus. As Crystal Gamansing explains, in England, more regions are now under controversial restrictions. We have to protect ourselves and protect everybody else. I don't think it's a waste of time. Lock the whole place down, lock the whole country down. In a city of roughly 9 million, reaction is mixed to London moving to the second tier or high level of England's three-tier alert system. The mayor says with infections nearing 100 cases per 100,000 individuals, action is needed. More patients are going to intensive care units and sadly, the number of Londoners dying every day is increasing again. The escalation bans people from different households from meeting up in any indoor setting. Liverpool City Region is currently the only location in England at very high Tier 3 restrictions. The mayor of Greater Manchester refuses a push from the national government to move the alert to very high and shut down pubs, gyms and casinos. To do so will result in certain hardship, job losses, business failure. It will cause harm in a different way to people's mental health and is not certain to control the virus. The British Health Secretary says the Northwest and Northeast have the highest infection rates. This is a time for people to come together so that we can control this virus. Discussions over financial compensation for Greater Manchester are ongoing, but even if an agreement isn't reached, the British government could impose the new alert level on the community. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Weathering the pandemic next, where Canada's snowbirds are flocking. This is the time lots of Canadians go south to escape the winter. The pandemic has thrown a wrench into their plans, so some snowbirds are heading to the warmest spots they can find within Canada as Robin Gill explains. Peter Fairhead staked out a spot at this RV park before it got busy. 
Normally, the Alberta man would be heading to Arizona or California. Not this year. I would take this kind of weather over cool or a foot or two feet of snow. I don't have to shovel the rain. The 2020 roadmap for Canada snowbirds? Head west. We should go to the beach later this afternoon. Karen and Kirby Stevens live year-round in their RV. The summers are spent in Victoria, the winters in Florida. We're going to stay until April 1st, but then COVID came, which changed our plans completely. They're finding themselves in the same boat, or in their case, the same RV as other snowbirds. Now, as far as they're concerned, British Columbia is as close to sandal weather as they're going to get. We'll get there eventually, but just we'll go with the flow, so to speak. RV parks and campgrounds in BC have the advantage of being open year round, but good luck getting a reservation. This year we filled up in August rather than October. We're seeing a huge increase in inquiries of people from across the country. In Ontario, Sandy Monroe is catching a last round of golf. He'll head to Florida in the new year, even though he's taking a chance. The warmth and the sun and the blue sky is more important than freezing to death here in the winter. Okay, bud. The Stevens family sees their own patches of blue. If you have to be somewhere in Canada, Victoria's. I have no doubt that that's why the island is so full. Back on BC's mainland, Peter Fairhead is making himself right at home in his RV community and has no regrets cancelling the American adventure. The situation just is a little unnerving uh, south of the border, so it's just, you know, we're here. It seems his feathered friends feel the same way because they don't appear to be heading south either. Robin Gill, Global News, Vancouver. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Keeping it in BC tonight's your Canada is EC Manning Provincial Park in southern BC. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.